Um, it is really exciting to see some, such a great turnout for our event. Um, this conference originated in a conversation that um, all of us have been having um, for, for a while. And let me introduce ourselves first. I'm Petrus Liu, and um, I'm Tamar Chin. Tamar Chin. <laughs> Virginia Elisar. And I'm Roy Chan. And we're all in the Department of Comparative Literature at UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, we started this conversation because uh, for a while we've been thinking about ways um, to take queer studies out of its uh, present U.S. institutional form and to um, expand the terms of its analysis um, and develop an account of all of those new and interesting, exciting cultural phenomena of transnational flows of information, bodies, and commodities that cannot be adequately understood in national terms. Um, so this conference was set up in a way um, for us to um, to accomplish two things, at least, I think. Um, on the one hand, um, it is an attempt to develop a more rigorous reading of such flows and people, um, DVD and the internet, and um, sex tourism are two examples that I could think of. Um, and also to put into dialogue people who are working on questions that are specific to their national context so that we can learn um, from each other's work um, and learn about each other's, each other's work. And today um, we're gathered here, and I don't mean for this to sound like a sermon, um, 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 we're gathered here to produce, right, to, to enable that very transnationalism that we're preaching about. So we're practicing a transnationalism in the doing. Um, and tomorrow's going to say context uh, right now, but to uh, bring these problems in, in, into focus and to look at the exclusions as well as possibilities that are coming out of uh, transnational contexts, such as conferences like these that continue to happen in different spaces. Um, and uh, we apologize then that the conference will be in English, that um, we'll be having, we've tried to sort of have as many interpreters as possible for our Chinese participants, but we, we do. We'll be uh, making some um, welcoming remarks on behalf of all of us. Um, Judith, Professor Judith Butler is um, an international <laughs> known scholar, um, a pioneering <laughs> figure um, in the fields of gender studies and women's studies and philosophy, <laughs> and has revolutionized um, gender or scandalized uh, feminism. Um, she is now maximally a uh, professor in the Department of Rhetoric, Comparative Literature, and Gender and Women's Studies. Let's show me and welcome Professor Judith Butler. Um, well, I just want to say that uh, the group of graduate students you just saw did a truly remarkable job uh, uh, formulating this program, uh, getting invitations out, and convincing all kinds of administrators to give money. And, um, and uh, the enthusiasm, the focus, the intelligence, the commitment that went into the organizing of this conference is really quite phenomenal. And um, uh, I even heard uh, in the dean's office, um, the dean saying, how could we not give money to this? Uh, <laughs> so that's, they're, they're terrific, uh, and, I, and I, I thank them. Um, I'm very pleased to be making uh, just very brief introductory remarks on this most remarkable of conferences. It's doubtless uh, important that we come together to ask the question of what Chinese queer politics is about, what it means to be, as it were, beyond the straits in all those senses, and what meanings of transnationalism work for this endeavor. We're here to speak about specific locations, China and Taiwan, but so many questions arise from this point of departure the conjunction and, China and Taiwan, that joins and divides the two. How does one traverse that strait? And how is the strait already traversed by what travels under the name of queer? Is queer to be located within a national boundary and as a function of a national identity? Or are we, with the problem of queer, already across the boundary contesting certain notions of sovereignty and questioning what kinds of connections are possible. The Pacific Ocean is doubtless also a strait, we might say, um, that needs to be traversed. And I thank so many of you who have traveled here so that this conversation can take place. We're not speaking only, however, about specific locations. 
Um, and yet these locations, I think we have to say, are not exactly set. There is a political history that sets those borders and a continuing political struggle that seeks to negotiate those borders. There is no way to say China without doubling the referent, and there is no way to speak of, about what might be Chinese without asking in some way about the border. What it thwarts, what it facilitates, what sorts of transits it makes possible, what sorts of immobility it puts into place. We can find queer people within these regions and find out the ways in which they organize their intimate relations. What is Chinese is doubtless altered by what is imported from here and from other dominant cultural sites as well. Are there then forms of exchange that comment upon and critically displace the dominant market models that would reduce our connections to exchange values? And what role does the politics of queer play in the recasting of those forms of connectivity? These questions become all the more important as we consider that queer politics is not just or not only up against state policies that are concerned with the reproduction of normative gender, reproductive families, and various cultural ideals of sexual exchange. These are real enough and pressing enough. But other major sites of power work as well to regulate and produce the queer subject. And they include cultural norms of discipline and development, non-governmental organizations that bring so-called humanistic and egalitarian norms into play, sometimes in order to decimate local cultures and modes of expressivity, the media, which in its visual iconography seeks to make China all too often into a consumer item in response to Western visual and erotic demands. Let us remember in this context that the term queer does not simply... It's actually the 26 that frightens me. Okay. Um, yeah. Let us remember in this context that the term queer does not simply describe the kind of subjects we are as if it were one more predicate to be added to the list. The term queer is not another identity category. It's a quality and a direction of intervention in a field of power, one that seeks to maintain, a field of power that is, that seeks to maintain a firm grasp on identity formation. So queer is not just another identity category, but a quality and a direction of intervention in a field of power that seeks to maintain a firm grasp on identity formation. In the context of this question, what is Chinese, and here I refer to its multiple locations and its shifting mobile meanings, there are specific histories and stories to be told about how the human subject is made, how the, hu how the human subject is maintained, regulated, and controlled through what cultural and national norms, in response to what imperialist demands and expectations, in the midst of what sorts of exchange relations. What intervenes into the making of the human subject along normative lines is what I think we might call queer. Because what is queer is precisely that which, within a given situation, contests the capacity of power fully to discipline desire. What is queer is precisely that which, within the sphere of exchange relations, produces other forms of connections, allowing erotic exchange to constitute new and unexpected modes of intimate alliance. What is queer does not emerge from some wild region of sexuality that is, by definition, unruly and pre-cultural. On the contrary, what is queer emerges in opposition to a disciplinary demand or a commodification that disrupts its determinism, undoes its fatal machinery, and opens up a space and time precisely in the midst of a space and time that is considered closed, predictable, regulated in the name of dominant power. Queer is then a form of power that disrupts what seems to be, feels to be, the inexorable quality of the sexual norm. In a way, what I expect we might hear from the participants in this conference are a number, uh, we might hear about a number of social formations, modes of representation, political forms of organizing that were not supposed to happen, that cannot be understood as a reflex production of the dominant paradigm, that were in a profound way unanticipated. The struggles to remake a subject in the midst of a set of cultural norms that would impose themselves through various kinds of force 
the efforts to produce coalitions across the straits, the effort to produce sites of non-normative sex and sexuality, the sites of visual and cultural inter-implication all suggest forms of connection and social relations that exceed what either the market or disciplinary power had in mind. It is then for me a great honor to become part of this conference and I welcome you to Berkeley. It is my thought that this conference is not about, oh, what kinds of appropriations of queerness have happened in China. That question presumes too much, I think, about queerness being something already constituted and China being somehow located in a way that it's not quite. The question seems rather to be how the thinking of China in its multiple senses reworks the notion of queer in the context of transnational connections. That is what we interrogate. It is also, I think, what we do, what we perform in the acts of speech, the production of new visual possibilities, new readings, the instating of new social and political alliances. In this sense, in what we do here, nothing less than our very sense of agency is and can be at stake. Thank you very much. to open up new discursive space for um, spaces for gender and sexuality issues. Her books are written in Chinese as timely interventions into local gender sexuality politics include uh, The Gallant Woman, <coughs> Feminism and Sexual Emancipation, which was published in 1994, Gendered Nations, Sexuality, Capital and Culture, in, also in 1994, Sexual Moons, a, a therapeutic and liberatory report on female sexuality in 1996, um, and uh, numerous other titles. In addition to editing a number of anthologies of local gender and sexuality research, she has also uh, she also organizes conferences regularly to promote local scholarship. Describing herself as a feminist sex radical, she shows heads at the Center for the Study of Sexualities at National Central University, well known for both um, its activism and its intellectual stamina. Let's welcome Professor Josephine Hope. Thank you, Peter. Um, I would like to say that it's a great pleasure to be here and to be meeting so many of you. And also, um, since I understand that some of our uh, friends here will probably have some difficulty with, in with English, I have prepared my PowerPoint in Chinese. <laughs> So I'm going to read my paper in English, but then you can follow on with the uh, Chinese uh, PowerPoint. I'd like to begin it by saying thank you to the Institute of East Asian Studies at University of California, Berkeley, for putting together this historical conference, in particular for the hard work done by my friend Petrus with Roy, Tamara, and Virginia. In fall of 2004, when I was in Beijing attending a sexology convention, Wan Yanhai, who is also a speaker this afternoon, has talked to me about hosting something like this, bringing um, the Chinese, the wider Chinese population uh, scholars together. Um, and he was hoping to host it in mainland China. Obviously, the Berkeley gang beat them to it. <laughs> but I heard that they were really going to do it in the summer. <laughs> Anyway, uh, the, the topic of my talk is queer existence under global governance, but I'm only talking about the case in Taiwan, so the subtitle is a Taiwan exemplar. Okay. My paper today attempts to examine the emergent hegemony of moralities that is constitutive of Taiwan's transformation into a liberal democracy. Um, this is a hegemony of moralities that is all the more urgent because it is a hegemony that not only embodies a vision of global governance but also brought on profound consequences for queer existence in Taiwan, especially since it's cast in mass moral hysteria followed by justified legal uh, attempts to control the situation. 
Since the lifting of martial laws in 1987, Taiwan has prided itself on its steady progress toward liberal democracy with an ever-broadening understanding of human rights that now seems to include the rights of gays and lesbians. The forces that open up social space came mostly from the various social cultural warfare, warfare that raged in Taiwan society in the past two decades, often launched by subaltern subjects, respectively women, gays and lesbians, sex workers, surrogate mothers, transgenders, alien labor, foreign brides, and so forth, who demand their share of civil rights while contesting the definition and applicability of human rights. For example, as conservatives use the notion of human rights to, di to discipline and purify social space in the name of protecting children's rights to a safe world, sex radicals call for children's rights to autonomy, sex information, sexual contact, and freedom from deprivation and surveillance by parents and teachers. Yet the newly created social space also provided conservatives and sensationalists a fertile ground to strategize their moral campaigns. While gay and lesbian groups have gained some legitimacy in the Taipei metropolitan area at the turn of the century as the city endeavors to build its international image of openness and diversity, on the left hand side you see 2003 Gay Festival, Individual gays and lesbians and other sexual minorities have, during the same time, witnessed the serial creation of a multitude of new locally and globally oriented legislations directed at not only all sex-oriented print material, but more specifically at internet access to sexual information as well as to sexual contacts. Significantly, the religion-based anti-trafficking relief rescue groups that had in, in the initial post-martial law era of the late 1980s supported working toward overall social justice and political openness. They are now exactly the NGO groups that have been working aggressively since the mid-1990s to establish new laws against sexual freedom and sexual variance, all in the name of child protection. I might mention here these anti-trafficking relief rescue groups were established by various Christian denominations between 1987 and 1990 immediately following the lifting of martial law in Taiwan. They will include the Catholic Good Shepherd Sisters established in 1987. It is affiliated with the Catholic Church. The Garden of Hope established 1988 the Rainbow Project Center, established 1988, both belong to Protestant denominations. The Taiwan Chapter of End Child Prostitution in Asian Tourism Taiwan, ECPAT, established 1990, comprises of half a dozen religious organizations, including the above mentioned ones. The important thing is, as much as these various organizations are religion-based, their social presence to avoid unnecessary social hostility has persistently downplayed this dimension, but highlighted their image of social service and child protection. These new laws include, the new laws established by these groups, pushed through the uh, legislation process, these laws include the local law to suppress sexual transaction involving children and juveniles established 1995, amended in 1999, and again in 2004, are talking and organizing. In another recent case, a young butch lesbian was entrapped by the net police in March 2005, just past months, and punitively sensationalized in the media for double stigma, being a member of a sexual minority and putting up a web message offering sex service to both men and women and specified farms only for money. So all of these things are happening and they're considered harmful for the children. The Children and Juveniles Welfare Act, on the other hand, has since December 2004 worked to censor all offensive, especially sexually, sexually explicit publications, straight or gay, in the name of child protection. Web contents will come under the same regulation by October of 2005. It is now obvious that the new legislations have greatly exacerbated already existing social sexual stigma against marginal sexualities, not to mention bringing litigation against many of these individuals. The child protection cause 
owes its amazing success partly to the numerous marketing lobbying efforts carried out by the rescue relief oriented religious women's groups with expertise learned from training sessions provided by international organizations. But such moral campaigns also ride upon favorable social sentiments provided by Taiwan's tabloidized media industry that continues to forge an alarming political uh, se social sensitivity toward any scrap of sex-related scandal. The picture on the left shows 2004, January, the police raid on the gay party, and all the members were uh, asked to stay as they are in their shorts and to be sh um, filmed by the media and shown on television. Taking advantage of the complex fears, anxieties, curiosities surrounding non-normative sexualities and accompanying sexual stigma, the media consistently magnify the daily lives of the daily lives of out marginal sexual subjects, probing and exposing intimacies and demonized alternative lifestyles, confirming stereotypes and prejudices. While gay activism receives only moderate media coverage, gay saunas, lesbian bars, busted gay home parties and alike increasingly come under the scrutinizing lenses of the media, igniting moral hysterias that eventually settle down with a reaffirmation of moral values and social vigilance, and often through new legislations. The progressive NGO groups that are now hardest at pushing to stamp out sexual diversity. I believe answers to these two questions have to do with the two-pronged mode of operations by the Taiwan state. On the one hand, a rhetoric of plurality and liberalness, but in Pacific, especially, sexual spheres and increasing policing of the marginal non-normative. My report then makes up only an initial effort to grasp this new situation that faces marginal sexualities in Taiwan today, and I hope the analysis that follows could work toward preparing the ground for the creation of a new vision and spirit of activism that will pr prove to be up to the task of navigating the treacherous waters of global governance within the wider Chinese contexts. These are brief descriptions of the two laws in relation to child protection, which impinges upon our basic freedom of speech and freedom of thought. The next session will explore the rise of conservative groups. It may be fruitful to begin our investigation with Habermas's analysis of the changing formation of capitalism, the changing operations of the state, the varied social position and social interests of different social groups. Habermas notes that the newly emergent active civil participation demanded by bourgeois individualism was a compromised subject position that combined familial vocational privatism, a lifestyle that is devoted to personal endeavors and achievements, and civil privatism, a civil political stance that leaves political decisions to the purposely, uh, to the purportedly professionalized hands of the bureaucrats. Yet, as late modern economic restructuring continues to upset traditional social reward systems, as well as incentive for upward mobility, and as the state increasingly intervenes in the social and cultural spheres so as to ensure economic reproduction and political legitimation, Traditional cultural mechanisms that help produce motives to serve the system are also disturbed, leading to what Habermas terms a motivation crisis when the social cultural system changes in such a way that its output becomes dysfunctional for the state and for the system of labor. And as administrator, it is within the general context of motivation crisis and cultural contestation that we can find an insightful explanation for the opportune rise of conservatism in so-called open societies and the continuous cultural warfare that rages there. In the case of Taiwan, the motivation crisis ex is experienced by many as a loss of traditional values and moralities, as a deterioration of the fiber of the nation due to flourishing commercialization of cultural life, or as the corruption of youth by the vulgarizing tendencies of popular cultures. Amidst a concomitant but accelerating sex revolution since the 1990s, 
propelled by feminist sex radicals and gay lesbian activism since the 1990s, alarmed religious groups that advocate moder moderation, if not abstinence, responded by articulating the widespread anxiety over the impact of motivation crisis onto the fear of rampant sexual exploration. A general social discontent is then conveniently displaced unto those marginal and non-normative bodies and practices that were at, this, at the time emerging out of invisibility to demand their share of social space. Iris Marin Young describes the new politics of difference in democratic publics as conscious acceptance, unconscious aversion. In Taiwan, however, Conservative citizen groups show no legal framework they helped put into place, strengthen state rule and state legitimacy, especially for the ruling minority DPP party, but more importantly because of the opportunities of international participation that the conservative NGOs have helped provide for the diplomatically precarious Taiwan government, which also constitutes a context of global governance that has profound impact on state rule. Simply put, the child protection anti-trafficking NGOs' affiliation with international anti-trafficking organizations, not to mention their original global religious connections, can offer easy links to other international non-governmental and intergovernmental organizations, such as the Interpol, World Tourist Organization, and various United Nations agencies, especially UNICEF, an international program on the elimination of child labor, and so forth. This is a connection network that the aspiring Taiwan government is eager to tap into in order to advance alternative routes of diplomacy and to promote affirmation of its envisioned independent nation state status. The NGOs themselves benefit from such a network too, for connections are set up for exchange of skills, information, and advocacy purposes between NGOs of the developed countries and NGOs of the developing countries which quickly and dramatically enhance the effectiveness of local efforts as well as their power of influence. International events hosted or promoted or assisted by the international organizations give strength and credibility to local groups and linkage to all these organizations brings added external pressure to bear upon national governments to implement measures suggested by local and international organizations thus effectively consolidating the global governance that is gradually falling into place. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, deemed as universally agreed set of non-negotiable standards and obligations, is now being promoted so as to identify national laws and practices that need it to be brought into conformity with UN standards. Taiwanese Legislative Yuan approved joint amendments to the Children's Welfare Act and Juveniles Welfare Act, effective June 1, 2003, merging the two acts in order to, one government official admits, bring the acts in line with United Nations definition of children. In the picture, it shows two women legislators very happily to, uh, masquerade them as pregnant women to give birth to the new Children and uh, Juveniles Welfare Act. They're more interested in putting on shows than what is included in the articles. The, amends, the amendments not only broaden the Act's act of applicability to those under age of 18, thus greatly increasing the number of youth that come under the auspice of the law in the name of children's welfare, but also more rigidly regulate the whole of social and virtual space in the name of child protection. In other words, the law's vigorous construction of children as vulnerable and constantly at risk has necessitated and justified a whole range of new forms of discipline, regulation of adults. All publications and the internet and other media now must be rated, and if found disseminating materials unsuitable for children would be subjected, subjected to high fines and temporary suspension of licenses. Parents and guardians are now held responsible for the activities of their children. If children under 18 were found to have come into contact with unsuitable materials, visited sex-related recreational business businesses or adult kind of video arcades, lingered at gambling, pornography, violence-related video arcades, then the parents or guardians would be charged and fined. 
Protection of children can even extend to before they were born. In fact, Article 32 of the recently amended Child Welfare Act prohibits pregnant women from taking in anything, including cigarettes, alcohol, beetle nuts, LSD, or other intoxicating drugs, which probably include cold medicine, that may be considered harmful for the fetus, not to mention coffee and tea. It also prohibits anyone from persuading or inducing or forcing pregnant women from participating in any activity that may harm the growth of the fetus. I wondered if that included sexual life between men and wife. It is noteworthy that these child protection NGOs have also learned to double the impact of their efforts in the establishment of such a network of social discipline by easily sliding into the identity of being women's NGOs. As the universalization of the gender analytics sweeps across nations in a global project of gender mainstreaming, and as the United Nations negotiates its global governance regime partly through a series of international conferences involving women's groups, mainstream women's networks in Taiwan, always including the above mentioned child protection NGOs, they have happily presented themselves as potential political actors and local delegates in discussions of global issues and, pro and problems. Conversely, the UN-sponsored conferences also offer these participation, participating civil society organizations a starting terrain for exerting political influence at home. Armed with international affiliations, child protection NGOs or slash women's NGOs find themselves welcomed by various government agencies that long to share that legitimacy and prestige. As the groups became increasingly empowered, child protection discourses quickly came to be aligned with like-minded, anti-sex, women protection discourses. And without a critical, radical perspective, it is only a matter of time that they became fetus protection discourses. Thus, we see Article 32 in the Children's Welfare Act now. Thus, continuously broadening the circle of protection and strengthening the conservative NGO's power of influence. Sadly, what we have observed in Taiwan in the past 10 years is the gradual transformation of path-breaking women's movement into protection-minded women's organizations. In the highly justified joint ventures of conservative religious groups and mainstream women's NGOs, new ordinances and laws have been put into place at record speed resulting in an intricate and constantly expanding web of social discipline and surveillance, which in the final analysis contributes significantly to the grand project of global governance. Constantly in dire need of verification as a true de liberal democracy, thus worthy of nation-state status, Taiwan government has recognized that it is beneficial to adopt a liberal language in advertising its gay-friendly human rights policies to the international community, and it does so at opportune, at opportune moments. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. Taiwan government's announcement in late 2003 that it would work toward approving gay marriages. In fact, it was little more than a publicity stunt to validate legitimacy of the Human Rights Award that President Chen Shui-bian was receiving from the infamous International League for Human Rights at the moment. The falsity of the announcement has been debunked repeatedly by gay and lesbian groups in Taiwan, but to little effect. So let's make it clear now, Taiwan is not approving gay marriages, despite government announcement. On the domestic side, the, po the political validity of the minority DPP government is in constant need of collaborating with conservative NGOs in instituting highly justified rigidification measures that not only strengthen state power, but also improve state legitimacy. It is this double race for legitimation that fortifies the regime of moralities that now encircle Taiwanese marginal sexualities. But of course, it's not just aimed at the marginal. It's a general social discipline which is closely related to Taiwan's reason of state. Habermas has already noted this kind of significant redeployment of power in modern states, namely juridification, as more and more formal laws are being created in the social cultural sphere, the private sphere, and the body-related sphere, 
that probe deeply into everyday life. The exemplary cases in Taiwan corresponding to the concerns of protection-minded women's NGOs and religious groups tend to concentrate, not unexpectedly, in the areas of sexual harassment, sexual assault, and child protection. And this child protection is understood as protection from anything sexual. Other forms of juridification, for example, regulations over surrogate mothering, artificial insemination, new drugs such as RU486, to us new, and Viagra, information on the internet and so forth, these forms of ju new juridification have also come into place in the past few years. They may appear to be natural responses to the arrival of new technology or new commodity, yet it is exactly because such new technologies or new drugs are introducing dramatic changes, such as producing new bodies or new relationships into the private sphere, previously dominated by traditional power structures, that they become targets for conservative agitation and state regulation. And the major form of pastoral power of the religious child protection NGOs and mainstream women's NGOs of Taiwan is none other than the continuous establishment of legislations that aggressively regulate sexual conduct, sexual contact, and sexual information. The effect of various regulations over civic life, be it bans on specific popular cultural products, boycotts against avant-garde art or film, monitoring of the mass media, rating systems for publications, whistleblowing on internet pornography and sex work, and so forth, the effect of various regulations tend to be multi-layered and often formative of the existence of state as well as the civil society. For sure, regulations of sex and the body directly impact on family relations, which is the site for labor reproduction. It impacts on population through the operation of life politics, it impacts on civil obedience because it actively forms habits of the body and it impacts on civilized social order infested with middle class tastes and manners. All of which prove to be indispensable for the effective exercise of state power. In addition, with the help of shame and stigmatization, legal regulations of sex and the body can produce other power effects such as contributing to a conservative social milieu producing a chilling silencing effect, or collaborating with specific interests or policies of certain political parties to limit the rights of marginal populations. All of the above have already been observed in Taiwan in the past few years. Just to mention a few outstanding examples, in 2004, a string of sensationalized reports of self-posted web pictures or homemade short films of sexual play among high school and college students be it mooning or imitation of sex acts as pranks, resulted in severe punishment dealt by their respective schools, thus effectively creating a sex scare on the internet. In 2003, a total of 13 conservative and religious groups brought obscenity charges against me, yours truly, for including two hyperlinks on the Zophilia webpage in my sexology databank partly due to the continued effort of marginal groups, as well as massive international petition campaign, thanks to many of you in the present. The case was exonerated both in the district court and the high court, thus defeating the conservative effort to silence sexual dissidents di um, while securing some to sexual stigma, social stigma, I would add judicial stigma for um, people who have been associated with any kind of court case in Taiwan, you are assumed to be guilty before you're proven anything. Targets of recent juridification in Taiwan obviously centered upon those areas of cultural politics having to do with sex, the body, population, and daily life. New power formations and new power techniques are now equipped with classifications and categorizations of deviance thanks to the expanding fields of sociology, social work, social psychology, criminology, and even gender studies, very sadly. In other words, the system is now capable of acknowledging differences and aggressively managing them. Discourses of addiction and pathologization are on hand to label, supervise, and demonize lifestyles and marginal populations. The popularity of such discourses further demonstrate that these power knowledge techniques are geared toward disciplining the whole population, 
since everyone could become addicted or pathological. If the expansion of state power over all realms of social life is built upon the regulation in the name of welfare, of marginal as well as other populations, it also confers on the state the power to manipulate existing infrastructure or make necessary adjustments in order to defend the so-called national interests, including the moral fiber of the society. Such an expression of the reason of state becomes supremely expanded in, the in times of real or constructed social emergencies. During the SARS scare in Asia in 2003, or the terrorist scare in the West after 911, for example, many rules and regulations were bent or newly set up in the name of protection national interests. I think the new word is homeland security. We all went through that. With new rules and regulations that go far beyond recognized boundaries of morality, the law, human rights, proper procedure, and international agreement. A more recent example has to do with regulations aimed at people with AIDS in Taiwan. TWA's Rights Advocacy Association of Taiwan, PRAA, has been and is at this very moment struggling against conservative DPP legislators' discriminatory language as well as discriminatory ordinances as the latter nonchalantly establishes PWAs as a threat to national well-being. Despite the fact that the state's failed or ineffective policies are the direct cause of the suffering of such marginal populations and will continue to produce such marginal populations, hence continue to expand the state's power as it regulates such populations. The significance of newly established measures of regulation and surveillance lies not so much in the restrictions that they lay upon individual citizens, but in the consequent shrinking of social space that exacerbates the survival of all marginal sexualities. These have all become reason of state. With a constructive sense of emergency and gravity, the state has granted itself the legitimacy to take unusual measures. Laws can now violate human rights. Universal surveillance is now justified. Reason of state has thus become a hotbed for fascist language and fascist measures against all marginal populations, from gays and lesbians to mainland brides, alien laborers, innocent, and to anybody, any innocent exploring net citizens. Ironically, many of the measures that make up this protection-oriented reason of state have been created at the demands of women's NGOs in an effort to institute marginal material structures to ensure equal rights and protection. Unfortunately, this desire to create a safer world in collaboration with expanding global governance is also creating dire consequences for queers. After all, consensus building in politics and economic stability often carries a strong power of regulation, a power that now assumes multiple forms with even deeper embeddedness in the multicentric world of global governance. Quote, in the multicentric world, power not only is dispersed, but it also assumes more forms than the traditional power analysis suggests. For instance, power can also be symbolic and reputational, as well as material, and it may reflect conventions and narratives. The fluidity of soft power means that it is difficult to capture and use for specific purposes. One implication of this state of affairs is that in the multicentric world, traditional power resources alone cannot assure stability and progress. The management of power must be based on norms and institutions. And this is a quote taken from Varnon's uh, book. Norms and institutions describe structural constraints, while symbolic and reputational signal a form of power that is extremely sensitive toward possible scandalous elements, elements that have the most to do with anything sexual. Such norms may very well be the norms of respectability that Iris Marion Young has described, quote, norms that repress sexuality, bodily functions, and emotional expression. The respectable person is chaste, modest, does not express lustful desires, passion, spontaneity, or exuberance, is frugal, clean, gently spoken, and well-mannered. 
the orderliness of respectability and means things are under control. Everything is in its place, not crossing the borders, end quote. As compliance with them has become a new standard of legitimacy in international relations, the new deployment of international relations tends to favor a social milieu in which the morally suspect of social space is not necessarily a result of monopolizing state control. In fact, in many parts of the third world, state power is now horizontally transferred to various superstate international organizations or downward to various local or grassroots citizen groups. In Taiwan, the conservative child protection NGOs have even written themselves into the newly established laws as watchdog agencies, thus giving them access to priority funding as well as deeply nested position within various government committees. Uh, member delegates from these conservative NGOs can be found in all committees in the Ministry of Interior and Ministry of Education. All cases, any kind of campus trouble will go to those committees and they're always ready sitting there to judge. Such a state NGO, collab state NGO collaboration is embodied in a mutual interpenetration of people and power money the NGOs serving as franchise for state bureaucracy and other times through a network of exchange between the state and the NGOs. The exchange of symbolic values such as mutual endorsement or mutual legitimation is also quite frequent. The result then is a new power formation that has been termed, termed the flat governance of new populism. Instead of state power being weakened, as most global governance theorists aspire, State power has become expanding to other social spheres and gaining strength in relation to newly constructed subjects for rule and in relation to new spheres where the regulation surveillance of marginal populations and their activities carry insurmountable weight, where bodies and everyday life serve as prime targets. State rule, gov global governance, Oppression of marginal sexualities have gone hand in hand in the case of Taiwan. The collaboration between the state and conservative NGOs in civil society has made progressive activism all the more difficult as new forms of regulation surveillance assume the form and power of legally enforceable laws. In Taiwan, one can no longer presume a clear-cut opposition between the people and the state. Instead, a people-state conglomerate has become a formidable obstacle to the liberation of marginal queers. As the double bind of liberal rhetoric and juridical punishment makes up Taiwan state's liberal democracy, it is this protection-minded sexual authoritarianism coupled with the shifting of alliance and developing global governance the Taiwanese queers and queers all over the world will have to contend with. Thank you. Desiring China, which is about uh, regulations of sexuality and desire in mainland China. Uh, I feel very honored to comment on the work of these two pioneering activists. Um, and I think, first of all, we should all give another round of applause to them for their incredibly fearless, path-breaking work in Taiwan and China. of them are much, much too modest about all of the um, struggles that they have gone through over the years to create uh, spaces for non-normative sexualities and to create a sense of um, pride rather than shame and um, the work is ongoing, it's very clear and both of you are much too modest. Um, I uh, was able to uh, read, uh, fortunately, uh, Josephine Ho's uh, talk ahead of time because it's a very wonderful, dense discussion. 
about uh, the rights of sexual minorities in multiple political and economic countries. And Wang Yinhai's talk is also kind of uh, complements Josephine Ho's talk very well. Um, Josephine is warning us of the dangers that happen um, as the organizing actually flourishes and has been pointing out um, the um, problems that activists have faced in Taiwan over the past decade. And um, uh, what I loved about her talk is her emphasis on these multiple political and economic contexts because I think queer studies uh, faces a very important crossroads and in some versions of queer studies it can be quite narrow and uh, talk about sexual identities uh, as if they don't exist in any, again, a path-breaking path in the other direction, that in order to continue talking about um, non-normative sexualities, we must talk from the initial years after the end of military rule, because that was a kind of euphoria uh, for quite some time, and uh, for many of us, it seemed like um, uh, all sorts of queer activities. And so that was also the other side of it. It's very painful to hear. Um, and again, Wan Yinhai is almost talking about the other side of that coin. And he's talking about a moment, uh, again, of flourishing, of lots of activity. And again, Wan Yinhai is much too modest because we all know how much he struggled over the past decade personally, uh, in and out of jail, in it, being thrown in and out of the country, and so on. Uh, to create that kind of open space. And uh, so it's very exciting to hear that at least there are some spaces that are being created and uh, Tsui Tzu'an will also talk in the next session about the second annual lesbian and gay um, film festival that happened in Beijing, which is another milestone moment that just happened this month, but he will say more about that in his talk. So, uh, so we're hearing sort of uh, uh, these um, different contexts that reflect one another in different moments of struggle over uh, opening up these spaces. Um, what I also loved about Josephine's uh, talk is um, how she links the specificity of what is happening in Taiwan with the kinds of uh, contexts of uh, global governance uh, that is taking shape through all of these NGOs. Um, and I thought it was very, very important that she uh, emphasized two factors. Um, here I'm just repeating what she said, that the state legitimation of uh, the Taiwanese nation state is a very, very important factor and um, makes for that specificity to link up to this global context where these NGOs take on new governance functions. And there's been a lot of attention recently to how NGOs are functioning in this regard all over the world. And again, it's interesting that Wan Yanhai has a slightly um, a different moment in mind when he is trying to link these NGOs to his activity at Eidersheim. And it would be interesting to put uh, these two contexts uh, more directly in conversation about how to uh, interact with these different NGOs that can get very influenced by these very um, reactionary uh, right-wing um, international organizations that fund them uh, to try to uh, govern uh, non-normative sexualities. Um, I also want to point out then that what's so striking to me in uh, Josephine's description of this uh, very uh, complex context in Taiwan is in, with these governance functions, we see something that, of course, Foucault pointed out a long time ago, that there's actually, that they are part of the process of producing and proliferating sexualities as much as they are part of the process of repressing them. Uh, that is, their hysteria, their obsession with children's sex uh, is very important to look at for the effects that that produces. Um, and again, not just because of repression, but that they're proliferating an obsession with how to regulate sexualities of all sorts. Um, and I think it's very important to see that they are part of the process of producing the very thing which they claim they want to hide, but they talk about it endlessly. Uh, they, they are very voluble about it. They go on and on and on about it. They write about it. They look for it. They spend much more time engaged with this stuff. Um, 
Sadly, than I do, I think. <laughs> I would like to be on some of their panels so I could watch all of this <laughs> pornography and do some of the things, you know, that I sometimes don't have time to do. And um, so I think it's very important yes. to look at their obsession with these um, matters of sexuality um, that they are actually proliferating as they continue to discuss them endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. Um, so I wanted to emphasize that point. Um, I also wanted to pull out another point in Josephine's talk that I thought was very important. And that is the context of liberal democracy. Um, Josephine asked two very important questions. One is how to explain this sexual hysteria in a time of seeming openness. And two is what to make of this new role of the NGOs. Now, in Josephine's paper, there tends to be somewhat of a dichotomy of uh, equating liberal democracy with openness on the one hand, and then this repression with kind of either traditional norms or with something that seems to deviate from the liberal democracy. Um, here I'd like to take up that issue a little more and um, part ways with Habermas, because I think Habermas also creates this dichotomy because he wants to hold on, he, he creates a dichotomy between modernity and tradition because he wants to hold on the hope that liberal democracy could work if it were not for these traditional repressions, or repressions that come out of traditional moralities. But I actually uh, would like to uh, shift the picture a little bit and see these exclusions and these regulations of non-normative sexualities as part of, as built into liberal democracy. That it's liberal democracy that itself is built on a whole set of exclusions. And I think we have to be uh, much more um, attentive, perhaps, to how liberal democracy does that. Uh, for example, there's been some very interesting work done on classic liberalism and how its exclusions were linked to colonialism. In the colonial period, um, the exclusions were based on something called reason and also something called civilization. And when uh, colonial rulers um, wrote about sexual perversions in the colonies, they constructed these sexual perversions in a kind of classic liberal democracy that they thought they were building. Because on the one hand, they thought liberal democracy meant all inclusiveness, but on the other hand, it always comes up against a certain limit, a limit of moral of repugnance against that which they find morally repugnant. And we still have today these liberal thinkers like Charles Taylor and John Rawls and all those guys who still today create these sets of exclusions even as they claim that the kind of liberalism that they are theorizing is about uh, all inclusiveness. But it's not. They come up against a moral limit that they themselves set. Um, and so the motivation crisis that Josephine very interestingly points out, uh, she wants to argue is from uh, destabilizing uh, traditional uh, motivations and of course increased state intervention. So, but I would like to sh again shift the picture a little bit and talk about this as part and parcel of a global neoliberalism um, where classic liberalism emphasized reason and civilization as those norms against which they were going to mark their moral repugnance uh, for sexual perversions, neoliberalism uh, actually uh, emphasizes desire. Neoliberalism emphasizes desire by picking up on the classic liberal question that was never resolved about how to relate the passions to the interests and how to regulate passions, destructive passions, uh, so that they could be turned into benign interests. Uh, and the other aspect of neoliberalism, I think, that is distinct is that unlike classic liberalism, neoliberalism needs to foster desire. They need to foster desire because we're in an age of increased consumerism and commodification. And in order to develop capitalism further in this direction, you need to increase people's desires. Okay, but the problem with increasing people's desires is that desires can be unpredictable. So you have to regulate the terrain of desire because if you let desire out of the bag, it might go in directions that you might not want it to go. So neoliberalism needs the terrain of desire, but it's a very unpredictable terrain and they have to keep regulating it in order to 
uh, make sure it's going in the direction of benign interest and not in the direction of uh, non-normative sexualities, for example. Um, and with Taiwan, I think, as with mainland China, I see a kind of triangulation uh, also because of their specific histories. That is, uh, both in Taiwan and mainland China, there's also a need to so-called uh, liberate desire from previous histories of repression, from socialism in China on the one hand and from military rule in Taiwan on the other. But this need to liberate desire from these previous repressions is actually a new form of normativity, of regulation, of uh, wanting to produce a set of desires that, as I say, will um, help neoliberalism develop, but also, uh, as, uh, again, uh, needs to be um, regulated. So there's a triangular relation between repression, which signifies the holding back of desire, and interests, which signify a kind of um, benign uh, regulation, and passion, which signifies excess. And it's in trying to regulate this triangular relation between repression, interest, and passion that I think we see some of the dilemmas uh, going on in Taiwan and mainland China uh, together. Again, because desire is unpredictable. And I think, therefore, it's uh, as Josephine Ho points out in her paper, which I really uh, think is a wonderful, pathbreaking work for queer studies, is that those of us who want to fight in the name of non-normative sexualities must take up these struggles against neoliberalism and global governance. We really don't have any choice because of their intimate interconnection. Um, so I think I'm going to stop there and then we can open up for discussion. Thank you. Okay, Marshall, and you're aggressively removing